Wars Battlefront 2 is we're going to do the same thing. We're okay. going to give all of the core base content over the time over the life of the product to players for free, but then let them engage in a live service that brings the community together, keeps okay. them together, and gives them reason to keep engaging and, over the long and term. charges them. Well, they can invest time or yeah. they can invest money. Yeah. It's completely up to them. There's a Latin phrase that goes post hoc ergo propter hoc, which means after, therefore, because of it. It's a logical fallacy that suggests that if X came after Y, then Y must have caused X. Positive. So if I clap my hands in Sydney Basically. and then there's an earthquake in Venezuela or whatever, I could say that I caused the earthquake because I clapped my hands. This is, of course, ridiculous, and it's the perfect example of why causality and sequence aren't always linked. I raise this because yep. there's a narrative doing the rounds at the moment that Overwatch is to blame for popularizing the modern day loot box, but this idea just isn't factually correct. It rests on the premise that publishers Overwatch care is really what is popular. popular, and since Overwatch is popular and it had loot crates in it, then therefore that's the reason why all these publishers are now inserting loot boxes into every game imaginable. Here's the thing though, nope. publishers don't care what's popular, Aussies they are care so what's smart, profitable. They if they cared about what was popular, Ooh. they'd all be making The Witcher 4. Ooh. Instead, we get this. So, that's a loot chest. And with that, you're able to use those bows, you could crush them for more Mirian. We also can go to Silver War chests, <laughs> and we're gonna actually buy a bunch of these and open up a lot of these. There's a lot shut of money up, to be up, made no. here, but publishers aren't following Overwatch, they're following something else. Okay. What if I told you that Overwatch are actually making very little from the sale of their loot boxes? What if I told you that the history of the modern day loot box predates the mobile apps that so many people claim to be the genesis of this whole mess? And what if I told you that this entire history can be traced directly back to the man that now leads Electronic Arts, its CEO, Andrew Wilson? There he it's is. It's a fascinating story that's taken me weeks to sift through and to understand, but now that it's all laid out in front of me, it creates a crystal clear picture of where this all began and where it's likely to go next. But to begin to understand it, I had to go right back to the beginning, and that took me to a place I never would have expected, the soccer pitch. EA Sports presents FIFA International Soccer, FIFA. the most realistic soccer game ever created for the PC. That's true. Experience the unique three-quarter overhead perspective that provides nope. the users with the best view of a soccer field ever designed for a video game. Like There's Diablo, lots of popular sports soccer. around the world, but nothing comes close to football. It's truly the world's game in every sense of the word. It's the national obsession of all but Only a handful of nations, football. and as such, the demand for mean? football video games has been there for pretty much as long as there's been video games. Okay. In 1993, EA had acquired exclusive rights to the FIFA That's license, soccer. allowing them to yeah. create what would forever remain the official video game of the world's game. It was an incredible yeah. catch, and still to this day, FIFA comprises 26% of EA's total revenue. FIFA wow. is the rock on which EA is built. Jesus but believe it or not, Christ. there's actually another game to which modern-day EA is now even more indebted. Developed by EA Canada, the UEFA Champions Football Series was essentially a clever marketing trick from EA to cash in on their football licenses. Instead okay. of just selling one football game per year, they could use the core game engine to sell different games under different licenses and trial different game modes or features in different titles to see which ones resonated most with players. But ultimately, it That's was the smart. same game every year. It just had a slightly different label on it and one or two additional new modes and features. The 2006-2007 edition of UEFA introduced a new game mode called Ultimate Team. A fascinating post from one of the original creators of the system can still be found on IGN's forums and in it, Chris Coates, who was the associate producer at the time, explains that his team had developed an entirely new concept that was essentially a collectible card game. But I'll let this video from 2007 explain how it all works. Okay. UEFA Champions League features a brand new mode which enables you to play football as never before. This new mode enables you to collect and trade virtual player and gameplay cards to build a team. You can then take your oh, team to the pitch now. to compete for UEFA Champions League glory. So how does it work? In UEFA Champions League, the user will be rewarded with credits for their play throughout the game. Credits will be used to purchase packs of cards to build, train and maintain your ultimate team. Packs come in three varieties, bronze, silver and gold. Any card available in the game can be found in any type of pack. Here we go. However, the better pack the more likely you are to find the better card. The here fundamentals of the modern day loot box were all here. You'd open it up to receive unknown Fucking items, FIFA, some of dude. which could be useful yep. to you and some of which could be completely useless. 
and it was heavily baked into the core progression system of the game, since you were constantly hoping for the right cards that, to drop, the because if they did, one, yep. you could build the perfect squad and steamroll your opponents. It wasn't pay to win at this point, because you couldn't actually pay real money for the cards, they all had to be earned by some means, but that would of course come later. The parallels That's to wild. collectible card games like Magic the Gathering or Pokemon Ooh. cards are really clear here, but there's an important difference. Yeah. In the case of collectible card games, you're purchasing an actual product, cards. Some of these are more valuable than others, but they all have some inherent real-world value. Hey, that's the what difference I said. with Ultimate Team's yep. cards is that they have no intrinsic real-world value. You could buy a pack of Ultimate Team cards and you're stuck with them because you can't take them out of the Ultimate Team ecosystem and sell them for real money or trade them for other goods. It's a that's closed true. economy that the manufacturer, EA in this case, has complete monopoly over. So they're able to set the rate at which rare cards drop and completely stop the resale of any of those drops outside their own managed economy. It's the closed economy factor that makes the video game loot crate so damn lucrative. But it wasn't lucrative for UEFA at the time because they weren't charging for cards okay. and the UEFA series wasn't really a big revenue spinner for EA. FIFA was the preeminent EA football game and when the UEFA license was up for renegotiation in 2009, EA let go of the rights in favour of focusing more on the FIFA brand. It was at this Good point idea. that someone suggested that the Ultimate Team mode should be retained and introduced into EA's flagship title. A developer named Matt Pryor, who would later go on to become FIFA's creative director, and he still is today by the way, wrote a design paper for it and gave it to his executive producer. To that point, writes Polygon, Ultimate Edition had been losing money in the UEFA games, but that was because they were only looking at the unit sales of the UEFA games. They weren't thinking about the potential revenue from microtransaction purchases of card packs. It was the executive producer of FIFA there 2009 right who realized what Ultimate Team could one day become, and he greenlit the mode into the next version of FIFA. Wow. What a motherfucker, That executive dude. producer's name was Andrew Wilson. The man who only four years later would go on to become the CEO of EA and who still leads it today. I want to pause for a moment here just to make clear how critical this moment okay. and Andrew Wilson is in all of this. Everything we've talked about so far predates the mobile game boom that ended up making people billions that is and true, Team too. Fortress's loot boxes and all of it. It just predates all of it. This all happened before yes. any of that was going on. And the loot box we know and fear today found its roots in a soccer game mode that would have been cast aside had Wilson not seen the microtransaction so potential within So soccer is the problem. It. FIFA's ultimate mode in 2009 I knew it, dude. Soccer's the the worst thing ever. Boxes immediately. Fuck soccer, such, dude. It was the first pay to win game on any console. Since the more you spent, the more powerful your squad became. Yep. The core progression system within the game revolved around what were essentially loot boxes. And it wasn't the cosmetic loot boxes that would be popularized by Team Fortress or CSGO or Overwatch. Later this on. was the Wilson loot box, as I call it, which was pay to win and hard baked into the core progression system of the game. Imagine and it was unquestionably a, a form of you. gambling since you had no idea what you were going to get when you laid down yep. your hard earned cash. The goods you received had no intrinsic value outside the game environment and you had no ability to recoup your money once it was gone. The Wilson Great loot box game. model worked. Ultimate Team became yeah. a successful and respected business model inside EA almost immediately. So much so that during the development of 2012's Mass Effect 3, Bioware developers worked closely with FIFA's developers to implement the first paid loot boxes outside of a FIFA game. Loot boxes had certainly existed before this time, such as in the Borderlands series, but Mass Effect 2 let you pay real money for them. One ex-Bioware employee cited examples of people spending upwards of $15,000 on Mass Effect loot crates, so clearly the system had an appeal to a certain type of player, hungry wow. for a competitive advantage in Mass Effect's oh my God. multiplayer. In the background, FIFA Ultimate was That's becoming a, a huge success. In 2010 and 2011 combined, FIFA Ultimate made $100 million. By 2013, it was $200 million. By 2014, it was $380 million. And by the way, this wasn't the sale of FIFA. This was just the ultimate team add-on where people had to Christ. buy packs of cards. $380 million in 2014. The numbers kept going up Why? and up. The Ultimate Team model soon spread to all other I mean, EA sports games Euros, and was dude. deeply ingrained into EA's emerging mobile ecosystem as well. In March 2016, EA's chief financial officer told investors that Ultimate Team was bringing in $650 million a year. 
by March of 2017, this year, Ultimate Team had grown to an $800 million business for EA, by cards. far and away the most successful implementation own. of microtransactions yep. in any premium game in history. With this amount of money flowing through, the success I'm of- pause this real quick. We've got somebody just donated and people think Star Citizen is bad. Can you play Star Citizen? Huh? Can you play Star Citizen? I don't know. I've never even heard of it. You can? I thought that was a game that was in development for 10 years. Is this still paused? Yeah. I just want to take a second, okay? Right now. Because you've got a lot of viewers. Okay. And eventually, inevitably, s someone out there watching the stream right now is going to become a developer of a game or some type of shit like this. They're going to work at a major company. Probably. I just want that person, that person or these people to know don't do this okay you are destroying gaming you will be a piece of shit your life is gonna be fucking empty you will be an empty shell you're don't... gonna be like the guy on the screen right here don't do this and that thing right there that's the dollar sign and all these people are just the kids that you're gonna convince to buy your microtransaction things right here and those are the fanboys that are waiting to suck your dick after you do it Let's play it. Pay to win was permeating every part of EA. Recently, it's emerged that the creator of Plants vs. Zombies, which was acquired by EA when it acquired PopCap in 2012, pushed okay. back on the inclusion of pay to win elements in the sequel of the game. Oh. The rumor that he was fired for this isn't quite true, but it does point to a clear desire on the part of EA to push toward pay to win mechanics as early as 2012. The disastrous like, yeah, wow. Dungeon Keeper app released in 2014 was another example of EA going the whole hog on pay to win and the backlash mirrored the one that we're seeing like today due to how beloved the classic Dungeon Keeper series was. Jim Sterling who then wrote Wait, for what Escapist said of the new EA Dungeon Loved the said. classic Dungeon Keeper. This Ke is no this is no time to be stingy. Spend a few more gems and instantly rush the building of this trap. Oh my no oh my that's so that's, disgusting dude that is disgusting dude what the fuck i mean come it's no time to be stingy yeah give the company more of your money 12 year olds go get your mom's credit card right now series was jim sterling who then wrote for escapist said of the new ea dungeon keeper a cynically motivated skeleton of a game. A scam that will take your cash and offer nothing in return. A perversion of a respected series twisted by some of the most soulless, selfish, and nauseating human beings to ever blight the game's industry. It's good to know that Jim Sterling hasn't changed a bit, and thank God for him. In 2014, responding to the Dungeon Keeper controversy in an interview with Eurogamer, CEO Andrew Wilson said some things which I'm certain could be copy and pasted into his future interviews on the subject of Star Wars Battlefront 2. Oh, he said go. this, You have to be very careful when you reinvent IP for a new audience that has a very particular place in the hearts and minds and memories of an existing audience. And when you think about any business model, premium, subscription, free to play, value has to exist. Whether it's a dollar, ten dollars, one hundred dollars, or one thousand dollars, you have to deliver value and always err on the side of delivering more value. A thousand dollars? These Wait, what? were empty words. EA did not learn the lesson of the Dungeon Keeper fiasco because they could see the revenue pouring in from pay-to-win elements of their games. Pay-to-win was deeply ingrained into the EA culture. A perfect example of this was the recent closure of Visceral Studios, which was working on a single-player focused Star Wars game under the leadership of Amy Hennig, who had previously headed up the Uncharted series. That was looking like a really fantastic, just great Star Wars game. And as she was presenting it to the EA board one day, they asked in response, FIFA Ultimate Team generates $1 billion a year. Where's your version of that? If you're asking those sorts of questions about a single player Star Wars adventure, then it indicates that the uh. rot has set in fairly deeply. But the revenue being generated from pay to win yep. microtransactions by EA was fairly yep. addictive for a very important reason. The revenue being made on the sale of Wilson-style loot boxes across their games was extremely cheap. 
On a regular product, say Battlefield or Mirror's Edge, EA needs to spend around 40 cents to make $1 of revenue. So they have about a 60% margin there. But with the Ultimate Team product and their related mobile products, they only needed to spend 20 cents to make the same dollar. It's literally wow. twice as good from a margin perspective to generate wow. revenue through microtransaction loot boxes than it is to develop actual games. And EA have what certainly noticed this. There's a mantra doing the rounds at the moment that publishers need to monetize in this way with loot boxes because development costs have gone up so much. So you might be surprised to know that EA's development cost today is lower than it was nine years ago. What? It peaked in 2009 and has continued to trend down since then. If you adjust for inflation, EA this year spent $300 million less on development than they did back in 2009. Well, the idea that tables. development costs are skyrocketing and that publishers just have to do this is a bald-faced lie. And it's a little more than ironic that at a time when developers like EA are claiming rampant development costs oh, are the boy. reason that they need loot boxes, they're in fact spending less on development than they have in nearly a decade. And what they are spending and back to, like, yields higher return than ever before. The impact of all of this new form of cheaper revenue on EA has been nothing short of transformational. When Andrew Wilson took over as CEO in 2013, EA had made $3.4 billion in 2012 from the sale of games and $728 million from the sale of microtransactions and season passes. By March 2017, EA was making $2.6 billion from the sale of games and $2.2 billion from the sale of microtransactions and season passes. If you adjust for inflation, Soon EA are make making 30% less from the, the sale actual of game. actual games today and 280% more from the sale of microtransactions wow. and season passes. The shift wow. in their revenue composition has taken them from a profit of $76 million in 2012 to a profit of $976 million in 2017. That's an increase in $900 million profit. And here's Jesus the kicker. Christ. We know that $800 million of their digital revenues exist in just one product, Ultimate Team. EA are not alone in this shift. Activision Blizzard and Ubisoft both off, now make man. I'm more money sick. from the sale of microtransactions and season passes. It's that one guy, dude. The one guy thinks it up. He's the CEO and suddenly everything changes, but I'm sure it's just a coincidence. The one guy. <sighs> wow. Than they do from the sale of actual games. But the key difference with those publishers is that their revenue model is far more diversified and far more reliant upon actual IP. Activision Blizzard in particular has an incredible stable of IP with its Blizzard franchises, Call of Duty, Destiny, Skylanders, and now the entire suite of Kings games, which actually aren't based on gambling per se, but are more based on the sale of extra lives to progress to their more challenging match three levels. Activision's nose certainly isn't clean in all of this, but as a business, it's had a huge number of commercial successes outside of the gambling-based loot box space. Why the example showing, that's wow. constantly brought up in relation to Activision's loot boxes, though, is Overwatch, which many seem to think started the loot box fad we are currently in now. But the myth that Overwatch is making vast sums of money from the sale of its loot boxes is very easily debunked. If you look at Activision's annual reports, you can okay. see that Blizzard's revenue grew $900 million in 2016, and almost all of that is explainable by the retail and digital distribution sales of Overwatch and the new WoW expansion, Legion. There literally isn't Ooh, any room Legion. left on their profit and loss statement for rivers of money flowing in from Overwatch loot boxes. Okay. Something I don't find remotely surprising given that Overwatch loot boxes provide cosmetics only and are actually pretty easy to earn from just playing the game. Now, I'm not defending them, but I think this is a really key point we need to understand so that we know what the true enemy is here. That makes sense. Overwatch loot boxes in the games industry are small potatoes. I don't like it, and I do think it's exploitative because I'm ultimately gambling for a skin rather than paying for what I want. But it's a very innocuous form of the loot box that poses no real threat to our industry. So it's easily ignored because the game isn't affected in any way by its existence. That is but true. But the Wilson loot box, there the one is. that is pay to win and baked into the core progression system of games, Look at that, that one poses an existential right challenge to our industry because as I said oh earlier, God. publishers don't care what's popular, 
they care what's profitable. Last year, two things happened. The first was that Overwatch released, selling nearly 25 million copies by the end of the year. And the second was that CFO Blake Jurgensen of EA announced that FIFA Ultimate was making $650 million a year on gambling-based loot boxes. This year, we didn't see an explosion of Overwatch-style loot boxes that provide only cosmetics wow. and can be easily earned. We saw an explosion of Wilson-style loot boxes, boxes that provide tangible power and benefit to the player. That's why I think the argument that Overwatch caused this mess is false. It started when publishers saw how much money EA was making from Ultimate Team loot boxes, not when publishers saw how many copies Overwatch had sold. And the corrosive impact of the Ultimate Team product is easy to trace from its roots to the very heart of the Star Wars controversy we're now engulfed in. In February That's 2012, so only a short time after the impact that FIFA Ultimate Team was having was being felt throughout EA, their label's president, Frank Gibbo, gave an interview where he said that EA were looking to export learnings from FIFA Ultimate Team to not only other sports games, but to their shooting... Export learnings. I love how they talk around it, man. It's disgusting. Export learnings. It's disgusting. An authentic Diablo experience. <laughs> and driving categories as well. That was five years ago. In March this year, the Chief Financial Officer of EA, Blake Jurgensen, gave an interview when discussing the recent announcement that Ultimate Team was an $800 million business for EA. And in that interview, he said this, Like Battlefield or Battlefront, our Star Wars game, which are very similar in the depth of play, we can possibly add a similar mechanic to that. He's talking about FIFA Ultimate Team. We spend a lot of time thinking about it, not for tomorrow, but over the next couple of years, you're gonna see a lot more of that in our portfolio. We wouldn't have to wait as long as Jurgensen predicted uh. to see the impact of these discussions. With their sports lineup already fully saturated with Ultimate Team style monetization, EA turned to their remaining portfolio for 2017, Need for Speed Payback and Star Wars Battlefront. Both of these games featured the same Wilson style loot boxes that made Ultimate Team so successful. Players could buy packs of cards to improve their stats and give them a competitive advantage. And since Star Wars Battlefront was a PvP game, the system was straight up pay to win. And to ensure that players were motivated to spend, the grind towards earning the necessary currencies what? for free was turned up to absurd levels, completely ruining both Need for Speed and Star Wars wow. for people unwilling to buy Wilson loot boxes. This tactic was not new. It was honed with years Why of practice in EA's Ultimate Team product. The backlash for this has been catastrophic for EA, but personally, I'm uninterested in the drama and the downvotes on Reddit and the mainstream press coverage of the saga. I'm interested in the recent announcement from three nations, Belgium, the USA, and Australia, where their gambling regulators all determined that they considered loot boxes to be a form of gambling and they would pursue regulation in relation to loot boxes over the coming months. Now I wrote this section that you're hearing now about a week like before this video stuff. went live, before the responses from the governments were made public. I wrote this then and I believe it even more now. In my view, EA as a company is overvalued because it's exposed tremendously to regulatory risk from its golden goose, the Wilson loot box. Its That's entire true. profit and loss success over the last five years has rested on what is essentially in-game gambling, and I'm almost certain that games with loot boxes in them will yeah. soon come to be regulated and taxed as a form of gambling. Not wrong. And the reason I think this is very simple. I fucking hope so. Governments love taxing vice. It gives them more revenue to play with, and they get to tell the public that they're doing them all a favor while they're doing it. It's win-win from a political standpoint. Are we the bad guys? Wait, what? Because... Like, we want them to tax it. I'm like... Yeah, but if you don't pay taxes, who's going to build the fucking roads? We need taxes. I'd taxes rather have are... roads than ultimate teams. You're right. Taxation and it's a dead set slam dunk when children are theft. involved, like they but are. But if you do not boxes. have taxes, now I wrote that a week ago will and a few built. days ago. Okay. A Hawaiian right. politician came out and said this: Hawaiian. We are here today to uh, ensure future protections for uh, kids, youth, 
and everyone when it comes to the spread of predatory practices in online gaming oh, shit. and the significant financial consequences that it can have on families and has been having on this families. This guy's young enough to actually understand what this he's talking about. This game is a Star Wars themed online casino designed to lure kids into spending money. It's a trap. Damn. Uh, we're looking at legislation this coming year which could prohibit access or prohibit the sale of these games to folks who are underage in order to protect families as well as prohibiting different kinds of mechanisms in those games. This wow. is a AAA title um, that's being released by the world's largest uh, gaming studio, um, and it has the most popular intellectual property in the world attached to it, and it's marketed squarely um, at children. Some of you folks who are a little <laughs> older may remember a character by the name of Joe Camel. Uh, he's not around anymore, and uh, oh, we didn't allow Joe Camel cancer, to encourage right? your kids to smoke cigarettes. That's right. And we shouldn't allow Star Wars to encourage your kids to gamble. I think the combination of regulation plus the overwhelmingly negative consumer sentiment associated with Wilson loot boxes will soon catch up with EA, a publisher that has only one major new IP in the works, Anthem, and has a better chance of closing down a studio than seeing it flourish to oh. become the next naughty dog. In the last 12 months, EA has destroyed the Mass Effect IP, the Need for Speed IP, the Star Wars Battlefront IP, and closed one of the great development studios of our time, Visceral Games. Wow. During this time, their stock price has increased from $80 to $107, a 33% increase despite not having one meaningful success this year. On the 9th of I May 2017, EA announced its financial results from the previous year and in that one day, their stock price rose 12% because EA was able Blizzard. to announce that Ultimate Team is now an $800 million product. There were literally no other successes to point to and yet their price went up 12%. Wall Street believes that EA as a company is 30% more valuable now than it was a year ago and if that isn't proof that Wall Street doesn't know shit about video games, then I don't know what is. Only this week, a Wall Street analyst claimed that gamers were overreacting to the Star Wars incident, saying that we were in fact undercharged. He suggested that if we all bought what? the base game for $60 and then spent $20 a month on loot boxes, we'd be getting a good deal, leaving out completely the fact that we actually don't know what we get in loot boxes. What the fuck? It can be what complete the fuck, trash dude? every time we lay down that $20. You really can't make this stuff up, wow. unfortunately. So here's what I think happens next. I think that governments around the world will come to regulate loot boxes as a form of gambling and that publishers I will begin removing them in all but the most specific of circumstances due to both regulatory implications, but more importantly, because it's clear that gamers now hate these things and publishers are unlikely to want the stink of loot boxes associated with their games. Gamers publishers unite. will find ways to monetize their games further, but I don't think that paid loot boxes will be one of the ways that they do that. I strongly believe that Overwatch will be one of the first to abandon paid loot boxes since the revenues flowing from them are low for Blizzard and the true value of the Overwatch IP is its appeal to all ages. Just as Disney don't want Star Wars and gambling in the same sentence, so too will it be for Blizzard and Overwatch. Oh, I also believe wild. that Andrew Wilson will not long remain as the CEO of EA. It was the it Wilson way. loot boxes that he rescued back in 2009 and introduced yeah. into FIFA and the one that he shepherded through the company over the last five years years that got EA to this point. In their entire time since his appointment as CEO, EA has delivered one new successful IP, Titanfall, and that was developed by Respawn Entertainment before successful. EA had even agreed to publish the game. Where other publishers have significantly expanded their what? IP portfolios over the last five years, EA has only left a trail of destruction behind it that does not position them well for the future. How Wall Street does not see all of this is completely beyond me. New leadership is required at EA if it's ever to become a company that is actually player focused and actually interested in making great games. Andrew Wilson is not the CEO to deliver on that vision. And the sooner the board of directors move on this, the better. Because soon all of this is going to become a significant financial challenge for EA. The one saving grace for this company that's seen its share price rise from $14 in 2012 to $107 in 2017 is its Wilson loot boxes. And they're now under investigation by sovereign nations around the world that's and consumers so everywhere me, are now aware enough of these tactics to begin to push back on them. I do not buy the defeatist rhetoric that loot boxes are here to stay. People said the same thing about cigarettes, but we push back on those too, and smoking rates in most developed nations have never been lower. I think the same thing will happen to Wilson loot boxes as okay. well, and when they do, I think that EA will have very little to fall back on. Good, strong IP is the lifeblood of this industry, and EA has very little of it left. 
I can't see a future for such a company when they cannot rely on gambling revenues to sustain them. Shit. Yo, this Star Wars thing is fucking ridiculous. Thank you literally buy the guns that you need to use and the characters that you need to play, and it does more damage? Yep. And you have to spend money on this shit? Yep. Wow.